Warm welcome to our MFA client community. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to our Victorian cohort. We hope everyone is keeping well and certainly pleased that there's a bright light at the end of this very long tunnel of lockdowns. So today we are pleased to welcome Sean Fenton, who is the head portfolio manager for Sage Absolute Return Fund. I would like to take this opportunity to remind the viewers that our discussion today is general advice in nature and does not take into account your personal situation. We encourage you to seek personal advice from one of our qualified financial advisors. Now, Sean, my only other disclaimer is that my children are on Victorian school holidays and they have been known to break out into song quite regularly. So let's hope that doesn't occur this afternoon. So to give our clients a backdrop, FFA have introduced Sean's capability as one of 15 managers into our clients' investment portfolios for two targeted reasons. Number one, we wanted to broaden out our alternative allocation we have within our tailored managed accounts. This alternative space allows our clients to be at certain times less correlated to traditional growth assets. And this has been especially important given the behavior of financial markets in the last eight months. The second reason FFA's investment committee introduced this absolute return strategy is we wanted to deploy a manager that use not just long only strategies, however, can enhance returns in the environment which we have seen this year. So Sean, before I ask some questions about the absolute return strategy, can you provide our clients with your background and why you're so passionate about financial markets? Thanks, Don. Uh, thanks for having me. So, yeah, you know, I've, uh, I've been kicking around financial markets for a fair while and had an interest in uh, equity markets for a very long time. Uh, my father used to run his own superannuation fund and uh, got me interested in shares and bought a few shares for me while I was still at school. Uh, I actually did my work experience at a stockbroker uh, in year 10 uh, during the 87 stock market crash. So, uh, a, a very long uh, association of looking at uh, looking at markets but I went to university I did a commerce law degree there and, and came out and joined Credit Suisse uh, in the early 90s 94 um, on the stock breaking side doing doing equity research I later moved to the AMP moved into funds management and uh, have been been doing that ever since I spent um, uh, 14 15 years at Tribeca uh, running an equity uh, long short fund there before set, setting up uh, Sage uh, last year. So, uh, yeah, a, a pretty eclectic and, and diverse career looking at everything from bottom up stock research, stock broking to equity strategy, asset allocation, quantitative research, stock picking, um, and running, running long short money for, for a long time as well. Excellent. You spent your entire career in equity markets. Can you share some highlights? in terms of key learnings and experiences during that period of time? Yeah, when, whenever I, I think back about uh, my career, it's always the, the really big events and the volatility that sort of stick out uh, in your mind. And uh, uh, yeah, it's everything from uh, starting my career at a and in, in 97 and, and not long after the Asia crisis hit, uh, currency crisis, uh, you know, Russian bond crisis went not, not long after that. The collapse of uh, long-term capital management, sort of potentially derailing the financial system. Uh, September 11 was a fascinating time to be in markets and the volatility uncertainty around there. And obviously, you know, the GFC was unprecedented on the volatility scale um, and shocks to economies and, and everything else. And then our most recent experience, what we're going through now. And uh, you know, what always sticks with me from those periods of market uncertainty and volatility is they tend to create opportunities and when the market moves to extremes and be it extreme panic, there's often opportunity there. Um, and when you think the world's going to end, it, it really does. It finds a, a way to keep on going. Human beings are very adaptive. We, you know, we see that through the current environment and increasingly through time there, governments and central banks have been uh, more and more supportive to keep markets going, keep economies going. Uh, on the flip side, I remember the dot-com crash very well uh, also. So uh, exuberance runs in both directions. But um, I guess the lesson is stick to your, uh, your fundamentals, what you understand, be very clear in identifying what your investment edge is. 
and uh, try and control for risk. And when you see a lot of volatility and extreme movements in markets, look for the opportunities uh, along the way there. So they say smooth seas don't make for skillful sailors. And I think um, yeah. this is uh, none more so in our industry, I think. So uh, certainly resonates um, over here as well. So you've, um, you've worked at some very large investment houses. Uh, now you're a boutique investment manager running your own business and your own investment team. What are the key challenges for you? And on the flip side, the potential opportunities? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting, certainly. Um, it's a whole range of organisations there from a global multinational in Credit Suisse to AMP was uh, you know, Australia's largest fund manager when I, when I joined that, um, to moving into more of a boutique environment then setting up uh, our own shop. Um, probably the biggest challenge is um, the perception of organisational size and safety that comes from the bigger institutions. So when it comes to investing, people's main, people are often quite risk averse and, uh, and a lot of large institutions and institutions, brand names do very well in terms of growing their business just from the perception of size and safety. So that's a bit of a negative, but the plus side, I think, far outweighs that, the opportunity to uh, get uh, the, the staff really aligned, having ownership in the, in the business and having you know, full control of your own destiny and decision-making, not get caught up in bureaucracies. And uh, there's a huge amount of that goes on in, in big organisations, the flexibility that comes with running your own boutique. So, uh, you know, you do see over time the best performance tends to come from the smaller, more flexible investment boutiques. Uh, you just got to get people comfortable that, uh, uh, that you know what you're doing and uh, you're going to be around for a while. Yeah, I think uh, the agility phrase rings true here on, on our business as well. We're a, a reasonably large business, but we still are small enough to be agile and provide that personal service for clients. Um, so having the robustness, but also the agility is, is extremely important in, in today's day and age. Um, you're a specialist manager of long short Australian equities. Can you explain to our clients what long short investing is and why should people have an allocation through a long short strategy? Yeah, long short's really about focusing on company relativities and being able to benefit from underperformers uh, as well as outperformers. So uh, it gives a lot of flexibility in terms of the way you invest in the products that you can uh, create as well. So um, shorting is very straightforward. There's a whole lot of passive index money out there. We can borrow stock from them uh, under a contract, um, short it. Uh, and have an exposure to that stock uh, underperforming or falling. It doesn't necessarily have to fall for this strategy to work. Your short stocks that are the worst performers, that uh, means you realise cash, you go invest that in companies uh, that are going to be outperformers. So it really enables you to focus on your stock um, selection skills, identify what are the best performing stocks, what are the worst performing stocks, and get exposure in your portfolio to, to each of those. And you can run that in the equity style fund or what we're talking about today, a market neutral absolute return fund where uh, you can create a product that just focuses on your uh, investment skill, your company selection skills, um, and isn't exposed to the equity market at all. So at an investment committee level, we spend a lot of time and money understanding each fund manager's process. And this process or system, if you like, is an important factor and separates the exceptional managers from the good. Um, you have quite a differentiated investment process. Can you provide our clients an overview as to how you dissect markets and analyze individual stocks? Yeah, it is. I think the real key for a successful investor is understanding what your uh, investment inside and edge is and being able to put that into your portfolio while controlling for risks. So we're very clear in terms of what we're good at, and that's identifying uh, where company earnings are going. And we've got a very broad and robust process around doing that. Part of it's quite systematic and quantitative in terms of ranking companies from best and worst uh, across a range of momentum, value and growth uh, factors. So it's a great way of exploiting behavioural biases in markets where markets don't price current information properly. Uh, the other way we look at it is adding value from in-depth fundamental research um, and looking both top-down, bottom-up, things like industry structure, competitive advantage, corner analysis, identifying which uh, companies are, are doing well, have good barriers to entry, as well as understanding bottom-up really what really drives their, their earnings. 
and, um, and that uh, involves understanding management, their incentive structures, understanding uh, what they're doing to run their business and all the financials that uh, go around that as well. So we've got quite a detailed financial modelling framework. So that's very important, identifying what, uh, where company earnings are going to. Um, and over the long term, it's a big driver of returns, but there's a whole range of other forces in the markets that are far less explainable. So successful investing is not just identifying good companies and, and returns that are going up and down, but controlling for all those risks that are um, harder to explain. So there are things like you know, central banks um, injecting liquidity or interest rates moving or market sentiment shifting around. And so a core part of that process is really focusing down on what we're good at and controlling uh, the risks that we can't explain. So a key part of that is we group stocks into eight broad um, sage groupings. Uh, and these include things like domestic and global cyclicals, defensive stocks, as well as growth companies, uh, resources and gold, uh, yield-based companies and, and REITs. And these broad categories enable us to look at companies within those groupings and identify where their earnings are going to without having to worry so much about forecasting where you know, GDP is going or, or where interest rates are going, uh, those sort of things. And keeping the portfolio neutral across those eight groupings means we, we don't take on broad market risks. We're not overly exposed to things like value and growth and uh, you know, what happens to you know, oil prices or, or interest rates. So uh, that's the, the real core of our investment process, identify what we're good at, uh, which is identifying company earnings, where they're going, driving returns, having a broad investment process that helps us to do that consistently and having really good risk control, understanding uh, what we can't explain in markets, what we need to control for. We've spoken about your investment philosophy and the absolute return fund. Let's move to managing risk in testing times. We have a regular discussion with our clients explaining to them risk management is an integral part of building robust investment portfolios. We've often used an example of investing $1 and let's say you get a negative 50% return on that $1, you're left with 50 cents. To get back to your target $1, that 50 cents has to earn 100% to get back to $1. I think this illustrates to the end investor how important it is to get the complex puzzle of risk management right. Sean, can you talk through your views on managing risk? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Todd. Um, I think I mentioned a little earlier on about the sage groups and the way we split the market up. So that's the, the first foundation of our, our risk management structure, which is to make sure that we're not getting too many systematic risks into the portfolio, looking at companies within those uh, groupings, so domestic, global cyclicals, they swing around a little bit more with the economy. Growth stocks will tend to have high EPS growth, so identifying that grouping is very important because as we see as real interest rates fall, PEs can expand a lot, and if you don't control your exposure there, value and growth can really swing around. Resources and, and gold stocks swing around with commodity prices and, and global growth. Uh, so that's a, a key cohort. REITs is pretty self-explanatory. They tend to be a little bit less volatile, driven by cash rates, whereas uh, yield stocks are things like banks and diversified financials and, and insurance, which move around with bond yields and, and the yield curve. Um, and defensive stocks tend to have low exposure to the economy, things like supermarkets, you know, Woolworths or, or Telstra or something like that. So making sure the portfolio is picking stocks within those groupings and pretty neutral exposures across them is a very good start in terms of ensuring we're not overly exposed to uh, shifts in the market and uh, systematic uh, risks going through there. But there's a lot more work that we do behind the scenes in terms of managing the, the risk of the portfolio as well. So uh, one of the important things has been quite dynamic in terms of measuring risk and volatility in the market and reacting to it. So um, yeah, for instance, uh, earlier on this year when the coronavirus stuck, struck, we went from a period of very low market volatility in the years leading into it to a huge spike. So the VIX, which tracks volatility in the S&P 500 uh, in the US, had been you know, averaging the, the low teens. So uh, volatility around uh, yeah, 10, 11, 12%, sometimes even lower 
when um, uh, the COVID crisis struck and, and uh, the world went into lockdown, that spiked up into the 80% range. So you need to be right on top of how risks are changing dynamically in the market. And within the absolute return fund, one of the things we do is as the market becomes more volatile, we take smaller position sizes, adjust position sizes down so that we're targeting uh, 8 to 10% volatility across the fund uh, all the time. And if you don't do that, you can end up in a situation that you were talking about. Uh, you know, risk increases extraordinarily across the market. You don't select stocks so well, you haven't adjusted your risk and suddenly you're down 50%. So we're very focused on uh, uh, what's happening in the market and reacting to that. Uh, and then the third plank, I think, of, uh, of portfolio construction is really uh, diversification. It's your most powerful tool as an investor, making sure you're exposed across a broad range of stocks, you're not focusing on anything uh, too much in particular. So liquidity and diversification are very important parts of our uh, portfolio construction in terms of managing risk. I still can't believe how underplayed diversification is out there, you know, especially in environments we've seen in the last eight or nine months. You know, you're looking at our portfolios alone and diversification has created a very smooth experience for our clients. Um, and you hear of horror stories out there, but I just still can't believe diversification is so underplayed in today's day and age. So um, you bring up a really good point there, Sean. Yeah, a lot of people tend to be very overconfident in their own expertise in a whole range of different areas, including investing. And people tend to overestimate their ability to um, predict the future and put uh, too many eggs in, in one basket. So uh, yeah, we're very focused on diversification and uh, having a very broad investment process that um, can identify a whole range of companies to be long and short really, really aids in that uh, diversification. So we've touched on process and how important that is in a robust investment framework. How long have you been managing money in this manner and how has the process worked through the fullness of time? Yeah, the, it's been quite an evolution, the investment process in terms of uh, the way we look at companies. So when I joined AMP back in 97, I was working in the, the quantitative fund there and it's very focused on ranking stocks across a range of different factors. Uh, then joined Trebekah in 2004 and, and really set up the investment process that we're running today, which blends that uh, quantitative ranking of companies with in-depth fundamental research and implements it in a, in a long, short structure. So uh, we've been running money in this fashion um, you know, for over 20 years, but specifically in, in long, short structures with this investment process uh, since about 2006, so uh, around about 15 years now. And um, it's delivered uh, you know, very consistent performance over that, uh, over that period. So in, in periods of heightened volatility, the benefits of active management really come to the fore. Can you talk through your experiences during these environments and, and touch on some key learnings? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I mentioned earlier on that um, periods of high volatility really stick in the mind in terms of the opportunities uh, they present. So. When markets become dislocated and there's, there's shocks and things are moving in different directions, that's a great environment for, for active uh, investors. When you hit those environments that you do sometimes where economies are a little bit calmer and uh, you know, policy might be easy and central banks and liquidity are just driving things, markets can become a little bit one-dimensional. That's a little bit harder for, for active managers. So we like to see a lot of different things happening in the market. So take, for instance, uh, yeah, the current environment we're going through in terms of coronavirus and, and lockdown. Suddenly things started moving in different directions and being on top of what's happening in the market and, uh, to economies and, and companies gives you a lot of opportunities. So, uh, you know, we put a, a lot of focus on what was happening with coronavirus, how it's spreading, and it created a lot of opportunities in terms of Obviously, travel companies got hit uh, very early on with lockdowns, but then the implications of that through the economy, uh, how shutting down you know, restaurants and pubs and clubs uh, impacts uh, different businesses, who has stressed balance sheets, uh, whose cash flows under pressure needs to raise money. So short ideas come out of there. I think one of the most fascinating things uh, has been the shift in spending patterns that we've seen across the economy. So people can't travel, they can't go out to uh, the restaurants and uh, out to nightclubs or whatever. Uh, so 
in aggregate they've saved a little bit more, but there's been such a dynamic shift of spending from travel and uh, everything else into spending at home and on homewares and electronics and home office, um, a shift from experiences and services back into goods. And you've seen uh, things like uh, you know, furniture stores, uh, uh, Nick Scarley, the shift to online spending, Temple and Webster or JB Hi-Fi, Harvey Norman, have actually been massive beneficiaries. Uh, and that's fascinating. If you've gone back into February, going to lockdown, uh, the economy's going to have the biggest uh, you know, recession since the Great Depression. Uh, going out and buying discretionary retailers uh, you know, would have seemed crazy, but um, it's fascinating the way that market can shift around. So those opportunities, things changing dynamically, uh, are great for an active investor to be able to, to capitalise on that and, um, and uh, yeah, make money. I saw the other day in Office Works or online, they're now selling toys. Yeah. So mum, mum and dad are heading there and getting their essential work work products and um, they're selling toys now to keep the, the, uh, the children amused while, while work's on. So uh, it's interesting how quickly and how things can adapt so quickly as well. So I've, I found that quite funny. Indeed. So um, there is an obsession with long-term investing and almost a back to basis approach to investing. How do you navigate the blend between long-term investing and short-term to take advantage of the opportunities? You know, we look at, you know, time in the market and timing the market. So you really have that sweet spot where you've got to look at both of those avenues in your absolute return strategy. Yeah, I always say that the, the long term is made up of a series of short terms. So you can't just focus on the long term and say I'm a long term investor. Sooner or later, you've got to get the short term right as well. That said, there's just enormous volatility in markets and they swing around. So uh, as an investor, if you just follow whatever the latest market trend is, you'll just go around in circles and um, um, burn money and won't make anything. So investing is a really interesting balance between um, conviction around your views and, and what's happening and responsiveness to new information. So we always emphasise a very incremental approach to new information. So finding that middle ground of, uh, having some conviction in what you think is happening, the structure of a company, its opportunities, as well as new developments and incorporating those. So um, having a broad uh, investment portfolio with a lot of different positions there, we rarely say, oh, we've changed our mind on this. Uh, our favourite long is now out of the portfolio. We're, we're going to go short. Uh, we're very incremental the way we react to new information. If uh, we hold positions, so our favourite long, something becomes a little bit more negative, then we'll uh, take a little bit uh, of money out of there. But you need to react in proportion. So yeah, for instance, back in January, one of the longest positions we had in the portfolio was corporate travel. Uh, suddenly you go into global viral pandemic, uh, international borders are closed, no one can travel anymore. Um, well, that's not an incremental bit of information, that's a massive uh, shock. So uh, we ended up uh, exiting that position. Now we've got a little bit more clarity on what's happening. They've got a lot of government work um, uh, going on. Uh, there's still a lot of essential travel occurring outside of, the, of Australia and they've got a low fixed cost base. So uh, there's an opportunity for us to get back into that. We did very well um, from corporate travels that uh, rebounded uh, and people start to factor in, this won't last forever. There'll be some normalization. So yeah, it's essential to have conviction in in your views, but also be responsive to, to new information, have a process that does both. So finally, let's move to the broader market and portfolio review, and indeed your outlook. We've just come through one of the most extraordinary first halves in history. How have you navigated the portfolio through the amount of volatility we've recently experienced? Yeah, it, it has been certainly a very volatile time. So one of the key things is you know, identifying what's important to markets and uh, what's, uh, what's driving things and what's driving company earnings. So I've mentioned a few times uh, yeah, the impact of coronavirus on, on lockdowns and, and that's clearly the, the biggest driver. So you need to identify uh, out of that what's temporary and what's likely to be uh, permanent what have uh, markets already priced in, in for companies? So 
when we, we look at the whole lockdown experience, there's been some certainly very uh, temporary things in, uh, in nature and that will include what we were talking about before in terms of some of the shifts in spending patterns. So we need to be very uh, wary of overcapitalising, say for instance, uh, the uh, very buoyant profits being earned by the, the retailers, and being too pessimistic on uh, companies exposed to you know, global travel or, or tourism or uh, leisure and the like. So you know, we see opportunities for that to turn around and uh, we are um, reasonably positive that there'll be um, either some sort of virus uh, vaccine candidate coming through next year or a degree of adaptation of society. Uh, I don't think uh, we're going to be in, in lockdowns uh, I'm sure and Victoria's glad to hear that uh, on a semi-permanent basis. Uh, human beings are great at adapting. Uh, they'll either adapt through developing a vaccine or adapt through learning to, to live with it and, and getting on with things. So life will uh, return to normal, I think, progressively through next year. So as an investor, we want to look at those opportunities. So you know, we see opportunities in uh, some of the reopening trade, companies like, uh, say, Qantas, uh, domestic travel starts to open up reasonably shortly, eventually international travel. Uh, that market structure's improved a lot, virtual duopoly, strong business, uh, things like uh, you know, Star, Star Casino, um, uh, people uh, are very resilient in terms of uh, their spending patterns uh, through their stocks uh, been marked down a long way uh, and not get caught in too much to you know, buying momentum in uh, some of the online retailers like JB Hi-Fi and Harvey Norman, um, we've done well out of them alongside. They're not really quite shorts, but just don't get uh, caught into those. Uh, but there are other things in the market going on that are potentially more permanent. So things like uh, the revelation of working from home. Um, people still want to go back into offices, but what does that mean? Do people go back into offices five days a week? Uh, quite possibly not. So what are the implications there for demand for office space and, and rentals? Uh, foot traffic through CBDs and exposure there, both in terms of uh, retail and, and transport infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, there are potentially some long-lasting changes to come out of this. So we're quite cautious on some of those office REITs and, and transport-related uh, companies as well. Uh, they could quite likely uh, be, uh, be permanent. Another area that's potentially quite long lasting is through this, there has been a lot of economic disruption and a huge amount of uh, forbearance going on within the, within the banking sector. So, uh, you know, for instance, uh, a lot of those, you know, office REITs and, and retail REITs and households are just not paying rent and that uh, has flowed through and put pressure on people who are just not paying uh, their interest or, or normal repayments on commercial office or, or um, home investment property. And the banks have um, basically been given the green light by APRA to um, pretend that's not happening. So uh, the, there's a whole bunch of potential bad debt built up in the banking system. We don't know how that's going to pan out, but what we do know is we're probably in for a period of very low interest rates for, for a long period of time. So we need to consider the, the implications of, of that. And that those low interest rates, flat yield curves, the RBA is focused on yield curve control. It's not great for bank net interest margins. A lot of competition coming in there for low risk loans from the non-bank sector. So we see the banking sector having two risks. One, what does their credit book look like? Their capital's been a bit uh, pressured. We don't really know the situation there. But also just long-term net interest margins return on capital for the banks is under pressure. So uh, structurally, we want to look for other opportunities. Um, the flip side of that, very low interest rates means that companies that can deliver stable growth going forward are, are probably going to do very well. So we want some exposure strong underlying earnings growth, be it in, in healthcare, like a, a ResMed, or in, um, in the tech space, like an, an app and uh, something like that, that can give a solid long-term uh, earnings growth. So a lot of opportunities on the long and short side, but um, yeah, identifying how the world is uh, gonna change, what companies are gonna benefit from that, or the impact it is, is key, how we position the portfolio. Thanks, John. So we've certainly seen in the last nine months um, significant drawdown and obviously a rebound from there. Can you give us a bit of insight of how the absolute return strategy has, has done? 
Yeah, so the whole point of the absolute return fund is to not take exposure to the market. So it takes long and short positions, but they're balanced out. So it's got zero market exposure, hence it's got a cash bench benchmark. So over the last nine months since uh, the coronavirus, all the fund's been running for uh, a little over a year now, performance has been very strong. So um, after food performance is in the, uh, in the teens, so greater than 10%. And that's been quite consistent both through uh, the collapse in markets in, in March and, and then the rebound coming out of there. And the reason we've been able to do that is through that focus on risk control, portfolio construction, but being on top of the investment dynamics that are, that are occurring through there. So uh, the whole point of an absolute return fund is to be uncorrelated to those risk assets like equities and bonds and credit um, that uh, can swing around um, and be a lot more volatile. So it's an alternative to cash. It gives um, you know, better returns than cash because uh, cash is pretty much zero at the moment everywhere. Um, so that's the, the whole structure of the fund through stock selection, being able to generate uh, returns for, for investors that are independent from, from the, uh, the equity market and the big swings in the, the volatility that goes through there. Sure. So COVID-19 aside, what concerns you the most or keeps you up at night? From an investing standpoint? Probably the fragility that's being built into economies and markets at the moment. So uh, you know, for the last you know, few decades, every time markets or the economy um, has a bit of a hiccup, central banks come out and, and cut interest rates. Um, but they're a bit asymmetric in the way they approach it. So uh, things go better, they cut very aggressively, inject liquidity, things get better, they increase things very slowly. And in this environment where the interest rates never quite go back up to where they were, um, and one of the reasons for that is the big drops encourage people to take on more debt, companies and, and households and governments. So we're in a world where leverage keeps increasing, um, economies become a bit more vulnerable because there is so much leverage. So when something goes wrong, central banks got to really cut interest rates hard to balance that. And this cycle keeps going on and it means uh, that the uh, economy is a bit more fragile. So when something does happen, then you've got to have a bigger and bigger response. But ultimately, that's not great in a, you know efficient sort of market sense. So the potential for long-term growth when we've got more and more debt and zombie companies and zero rates and dysfunction across financial markets, it's not a great environment for having you know, dynamic economies that are robust and allocating resources efficiently and, and growing uh, markets. So that probably worries me at the moment that central banks have become very short-sighted in their policy response. No one wants to really uh, uh, bring any bad news or, or do anything that's a, a little bit tough. And we're in this environment where markets and economies are now very fragile. So Sean, let's conclude on how the Absolute Return Fund is positioned for the remainder of 2020. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier on, we, uh, we don't take big thematic positions, so we're pretty neutral across the eight SAGE groupings. Um, but we are generally a little bit more positive in terms of getting back to period of normalcy uh, across economies and, and markets. So uh, that will include you know, things like within, uh, say, uh, some the cyclical sectors, we want some more exposure to uh, you know, travel, things like you know, Qantas and, and Leisure, Star, Star Group, rather than the, the retailers. Within um, growth stocks, we want um, companies that are exposed to solid long-term earnings growth. So uh, one dynamics, the US with low interest rates, housing's uh, really gone uh, booming and they've had an underbuild since the GFC. So James Hardy, we quite like there. Well, companies that just deliver strong earnings growth and have been a little bit impacted by referrals like, uh, like a ResMed uh, or you know, high technology like uh, Appen. So we like uh, those sort of companies. Within, um, say, resources, uh, we think iron ore is probably as good as, it, um, as good as it gets. So we want more strategic positioning around you know, opportunities and maybe some of the, the rare earths like a Linus or um, you know, stable domestic gas like a Senex Energy. Uh, within uh, you know, some of the, the cyclicals, um, you know, domestically, we're a little bit more cautious on housing construction compared to the US. Um, population growth's under pressure. We've, we've had a little bit of a overbuild through there. So there are some uh, you know, potential funding positions, but 
in general, we're a little bit more optimistic about um, the world getting back to normal, people adapting and um, looking for uh, some of those uh, opportunities uh, across the market. I've got one more too, Sean. Uh, it's always important as an active manager to obviously time your entry and then time your exit. You know, you mentioned these companies, um, obviously it's a point in time. So what sort of turnover do you have in your portfolio in, in, in an average year, for example? So the, the turnover uh, is quite high because we are quite active. So um, within the absolute return fund, we'll be turning the entire portfolio, portfolio over several times uh, a year. And that's a function of a couple of things. It's the way we approach investing, that incremental approach. So we've got a very diverse source of information from our, our ranking process as well as our, our company research. And we don't want to, as I mentioned, just kick stocks in and out. We adjust the positions uh, incrementally to, to new information. And we are quite active in terms of the way that we do that. Um, also, the structure of the long short fund means we're able to make money um, by identifying good and bad companies within sectors. And so that means we can be um, up to 200% long and 200% short in the portfolio. And that enables us to really take advantage of our relative stock ideas to, to drive returns. And that means uh, there's more opportunity to rebalance and, and turn the portfolio over as well. So that's really important to note as investment managers, we want to make sure that our clients money is being actively managed. Uh, and that's where uh, a lot of added return can be added to, to our client's portfolio. So really important to note that it's not a set and forget type of thing. It's a very fluid situation um, because we have a fluid environment. And it's not just because uh, COVID-19, there's always different levers that we can pull uh, at, at certain times in different valuation points of the market. So that's, um, that's some really good uh, insight. So Sean, I wanna thank you for spending some time with me today. I really wanted to convey to our clients that the managers we choose have robust frameworks to create long-term outperformance with risk management being at the forefront of our portfolio builds. So really thank you for your time and uh, look forward to chatting to you soon. Thanks, Ty. Thanks for having me on and, uh, and, and showing the interest and thanks to the clients as well.